Hi, this is Michael Golf Zero Papa Oscar Tango on a sunny but chilly December morning and uh, I would like to do a very quick um, review of the Soda Beams SB6 6 meter um, beam. Now this is uh, I think uh, a version of a Moxon uh, antenna by Les uh, Moxon G6 and um, X-Ray November from his book HF Antennas for All Locations. Um, but uh, re reimagined by Richard from uh, Sota Beams. Um, I think the, the, the Moxon is essentially a, um, a folded beam with the, uh, a single reflector um, and a two-part two driven element, but with the ends folded back towards each other. So they end up with a, um, a capacitive gap, uh, which the dimensions of which I think are quite critical. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Richard manages to, uh, to, to maintain that. Um, I've also seen uh, comments about the difficulty of building something like this with lightweight um, components, because of course as the antenna moves, the dynamics of it may change and that may affect the SWR. So it'll be interesting to see how well it works in, in practice. So let me start with a quick unpackaging of the actual antenna. So it comes with a couple of spreaders, a little couple of separators which are going to go between the, um, the driven elements and the reflector. Um, they're laser cut by the looks of things out of, um, I'm not sure what the material is actually, it's the kind of Perspex PVC type material. And I can see that uh, Richard has scored marks on the surface of these, so I think that's probably going to be part of the, the measurement of getting the, the actual elements the right length. So there's those two. Right, now onto the big bag. And cutting away from myself, of course, the antenna itself. So we have. A lovely little soda beams antenna bag, put it all in. We have the spreaders, which I think are fiberglass. And um, I know Richard discusses uh, painting these. And um, I have a, another antenna made out of something similar. And you can get um, little glass splinters in your hands if you're not careful. So it's definitely worth either painting it or covering it with something. And I may have a look at shrink, uh, heat, heat shrink sleeving to see if that's uh, a viable option. So those are the spreaders. What else have we got? We have the wire. So that's going to form the single reflective element and the two-part driven element. So the antenna is actually fed from the front, which is a, probably looks a little bit odd when, you, when you've got set up. It's like Christmas. Aha, so this is Richard's um, universal hub. So the idea is this sits in the middle on your um, fishing pole mast or whatever you're going to use. The spreaders come out of the holes with the antenna fitted around the outside. And I think Richard intends this to be a universal hub that you could use to make a two meter, a four meter, or a six meter um, moxon, depending on the length probably of the spreaders. And finally, um, end caps and, um, and some additional spreaders. So that's interesting, be able to see uh, why we've got um, two sets. Maybe I've just got a bonus, you never know. <laughs> Um, the antenna is fed with a coax and a BNC, terminating the BNC. So one of the spreaders I see has got um, a BNC connector and a couple of uh, terminals to connect the antenna wire back to. Um, and I know Richard recommends feeding this with um, coax via uh, um, a little ballon just to stop the coax from becoming part of the antenna itself. So i um, have to look at uh, what we can set up for that. Okay, let me go and start building this because clearly it's come as in a slightly kit form. I'm gonna to have to cut the wires and uh, measure those all out, cut them and build the antenna as a starting point before I can actually use it. So let's get building and see what we end up with. Hi, so here we are, post build. 
not, not that difficult to make. It was uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so we're going to just take you through a couple of things that I've picked up along the way of making uh, the SB6. First of all, I did say about the fiberglass rods um, and getting splinters. Uh, Richard puts in a, uh, a little information sheet just to make sure um, you don't hurt yourself uh, and recommending you wear gloves and obviously in the instructions it talks about painting the fiberglass rods. So I just wore the very thin surgical gloves while I was constructing um, and what I've done actually is, is I've coated the um, the spreaders in some spiral cable tidy that I got from Maplin for about five pounds. Um, it gives you more than enough to do the job and uh, plenty to spare afterwards. So, so I've added that to the um, to, to the spreaders rather than painting them. It's very quick and effective. I'll see how well that works over time. Uh, other things I noted. You'll remember I mentioned that I seem to have an extra pack of um, the separators, and that is because they break very very easily uh, if you put any force on these. They've got a little score line on them, which um, shows you where to. Uh, to, to bring the end of the cable to. It's quite critical, I think, the gap between the end of the cable. Um, and if you put any pressure on these, they snap instantly. So I recommend when using them, you feed the cable through the two holes in the end, hold them by the very end while you're getting that right and in position. If you hold it in the middle and start pulling the cable around, you're gonna snap it, snap it off very quickly. So, what else did I find? Um, the five glass spreaders splinter on the end. Uh, you'll notice that when you push it into the hub. Um, the hub's quite a tight fit, it needs to be, and, uh, and you'll see a lot of splintering coming from the five glass rods. I find if you just chamfered those off with a very fine file or a bit of emery paper, um, that, that reduces the amount of glass splintering. You may also be tempted when you start constructing and you bring those two um, soldered lugs back to the connection point, you may think oh, it would be a really good idea to cut those rings uh, and make them into a hook so that you can just hook them over. Um, but actually there's quite a lot of pressure on that, that's quite tight. Um, can't quite get a note out of it, but um, that's quite tight so you don't want to do that. It does mean you have to unscrew the, um, the binding post completely. I'm always a bit dubious about doing that on a hillside with cold fingers, but they're fairly big, they're fairly substantial, so that shouldn't be too bad. Okay, so uh, this is the, the finished piece. This is the universal hub. This is the uh, rear connector, or the front connector actually, with the, um, with the binding post. It's a BNC female on there, so you're gonna need a male socket and uh, ballon on the end of your coax. Those are the little separators. As you can see, um, cables cut to the end uh, and aligned with the little score marks on the, on the separator itself. Um, one comment about cutting the cable to length. <laughs> when, you, when you cut the cable, make sure the inner conductor is actually um, aligned with the end of the insulator. When I cut my first one, and subsequently looked at the cable, I realized that the actual conductor was actually some distance inside the insulator. Um, but fortunately I had plenty of spare cable, so uh, that, that wasn't a problem at all. Well, there we go. Um, that is the, uh, the beast. It was very quick to, to make, um, very quick to put together. What, what I have noticed is when you put it together, um, it takes a little bit of fiddling around just to get the cable in the right place so that you've got the right distance between each part and no big bends on the um, spreaders. What I might do is see if I can find a way of just marking those or putting some little zip ties around them to get, keep them in about the right place. And, uh, and that should speed up the, the construction. So we're gonna give it a go. It's um, December, it's a lovely sunny day in December, but uh, um, VHF isn't particularly fantastic. So uh, uh, I'm gonna give it a go today here on, the, uh, on my little mast on the Land Rover. Um, but then we're going to be using this in the, um, the RSGB um, UK activity contest uh, starting in January. So I'll give it a go in January and hopefully report back on how effective it was actually in the field. So after I finished recording, I operated for about 40 minutes. There were the Christmas VHF cumulative contest uh, going on. So I managed to work five uh, UK stations 
Um, some of it's search and paint, some of it's uh, calling and getting responses. Uh, I think the furthest one was about 100 kilometers on the day, which wasn't bad given that it was quite flat conditions. Okay, let's summarize about the build and construction of the SB6. As mentioned before, rather than painting my spreaders uh, to protect the, my hands from the glass fibre, um, I've used spiral cable wrap. Uh, this is 12 mil millimeter spiral cable wrap. Um, it was five pounds for 10 meters, uh, which is twice as much as you'll need. Um, and I bought that from Maplin. So I will put a, uh, a link and the reference code for it in the comment section below. My SB6 is about 780 grams with the plastic cable wrap on the spreaders. Um, I think in total, once it's bagged up and with a, a couple of other little bits in, in the bag, it's a, just a little less than 800 grams in total. So it's, it's very lightweight for carrying up to a, a hilltop if you want to go portable with it. The package is about 58 centimetres long and probably takes up about a 10 centimetre um, cross section. Uh, in, in diameter so uh, it's it's a reasonable size to be able to slip inside a backpack if uh, if you want to go portable with it. Those orange spaces they are incredibly easy to snap as I recommended before make sure you hold them on the actual from the ends um, it's a bit fiddly while you're putting the wire through them but it stops you from putting undue pressure um, and snapping them. So uh, hold them on the ends while you're connecting the, the wires. Once they're set up, um, they're, they're only ever intention so that they're perfectly st strong enough for what they need to do. Now, you'll see when you come to push the spreaders into the hub, you get that little bit of splintering at the ends. It's quite a tight fit. It obviously needs to um, hold itself together. So what I've done is just got a, a very small needle file um, and, and just put a chamfer on the end of the spreader and that just uh, takes, the, uh, takes the edge off it a little bit and stops it from splintering. Um, this bit you can't unfortunately paint or coat with anything because it's a tight fit in the hub uh, and you don't want the splintering every time you push it together because otherwise you end up with those splinters in your hands. There's not really that much to constructing the aerial itself, apart from obviously measuring the cable lengths uh, correctly to make the elements. But you do have to solder a couple of lugs. Um, fairly straightforward. As long as you've got a soldering iron, a little bit of solder, you can't go wrong. Once the antenna is made, the actual putting it together time um, in the field is very short. Four minutes without rushing, I can have the antenna from being in the bag to completely constructed on the floor ready to go up and actually in six minutes I can have it erected, cables coax connected and um, hoisted up on a telescopic mast so uh, very quick to deploy. When it comes to packing up your antenna and winding the elements onto the wire winder if you're careful about where you start the process you can be sure that those two orange separators will lay flat against the wire winder as you can see from my picture, I start with the lug at about the midpoint on the wire winder um, and go from there. And each each orange spreader ends up uh, separator, sorry, ends up flat against the uh, the wire winder. Obviously, the little rubber end caps that go onto the um, the spreaders they stay in situ on the wire. Okay, so finally, let's look at the SWR. Um, as you can see from the uh, from the pictures. Um, th there's a dip just below 50 megs at about 49.7 megs um, where the SWR is about 1.3 to 1. As we start at the bottom of the band at 50 megs, um, my SB6, as made without any tweaking or, or uh, further adjustment, was about 1.4 to 1. At 51 megs, it was about 1.7 to 1, and at 52 megs, about 1.8 to 1. And as you can see from the uh, display in the antenna analyzer, once you get past that initial little dip, um, the SWR and the impedance of the antenna remain reasonably flat around the 1.7, 1 1.8 um, to 1 SWR and about uh, 83 ohms um, for, the, uh, for the impedance. So to wrap up, the SB6 seems to be a really nicely made little antenna. It's very quick to erect, 
um, the the universal hub works really nicely and fits on a telescopic pole really well and it's thick enough that it's not going to put undue pressure if it gets a little bit windy um, and the ante antenna starts moving around. There are a few delicate parts when it comes to constructing the antenna so so long as you're a little bit careful when putting it together for the first time everything should go well. With regards to performance clearly it works but uh, we'll wait and see how we get on in the UK activity contests uh, in 2015 and I will report in the comment section below how I'm getting on as the year progresses. Okay, that concludes my review of the SOTA Beam's SB6 6 meter beam.